It's this time for Thomas Harklow. Yeah. Good to see so many here still. Uh, now we're going to, add, uh, I'm Thomas Harkler, CEO of Kite Mail. Uh, in this presentation, I want to address uh, the net zero in 2050 and what the urban wind can do uh, to achieve this. And my, my hope is that this sort of could go into the introduction of presentations and papers about the urban wind. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, f first, let's talk about uh, the outlook, how it is today, uh, or rather how it was in 2021. Then wind power was expected to take one third together with solar and other sources. Then, as you know, something not so good have happened since then in the wind industry, uh, very much caused by the scaling race. Uh, the wind industry is struggling, struggling with quality and uh, um, they have to write down the values. And uh, this led to the International Energy Agency reducing the expectations for wind energy in their update in 2023. And this is bad in several ways because, of course, we need to increase solar and other sources. And these are sources that need more storage. And storage is maybe the only thing that the uh, admit that is not ready, it's not a mature technology, we don't know how to solve it yet. So we, we do have challenges. What I believe is that Ebon Wind can come in and play a crucial role here and help us to change this the other way around. So wind power can then take a larger part of the global energy mix. We would need less storage and we will have a more likely solution that actually will work. So just to keep you up on the total numbers, we're going to build from 2030 uh, for the next coming 20 years, almost 12,000 gigawatt of new renewable energy capacity. This is, of course, most solar because we need more solar if it's going to deliver similar amount of energy as wind. But uh, it's quite substantial amount of renewable capacity we need. And this is what's really concerning our policymakers uh, at this moment. If we look on how uh, urban wind could compare to solar and conventional wind uh, in supplying the same amount of uh, uh, power or same amount of energy, we, we could use less capacity, of course, because we reach higher, better wind resources and we have a higher capacity factor. I'm more conservative than what's been presented here earlier today doesn't matter how good it is. Uh, if it's better, that's enough to sort of sign out this one. With solar, of course, we would need much more capacity because the capacity is, is worse uh, than conventional wind and especially airborne wind. If you look into the materials you need to produce power, what amazed me that I didn't know is that you actually need equally much material for solar that you would need for uh, conventional wind to produce the same amount of energy. Uh, it's approximately half compared to the capacity, but it's the same when it comes to the amount of energy. The reason for that is obviously because you need concrete foundation, you need glass over these panels, there is a lot of metal involved and it's covering the whole area that you're going to produce solar with. Um, and the next point, and I think this is the final factor that sort of makes out what is a potential dominating energy production technology if it can sort of hook off all of these three. The next thing is the power density. Can you, can you actually deploy this in small enough area over large pl pl enough places of the world? Uh, th this is also important, but uh, I will get back to why it's not that urgent. But I, I really think that Airborne Wind have the potential to do this because we are addressing a bigger airspace, more wind resources from the same ground area. And this is exactly the only reason why we are building taller wind turbines and we are ending up in this scale-up race, something we can already prove now with a lot of prototypes and even systems that can generate power curves. If we look into this in uh, a life cycle analysis uh, uh, mass estimate, it changes slightly because the solar panels will last longer than the wind turbines. It has an expected lifespan of 35 years, but still 
what we see from the study by uh, Luke von Hagen, uh, Ampex 5 megawatt system would score very well with the amount of materials. Even our small 20 kilowatt system uh, would actually be better than both solar and, uh, and uh, conventional wind if we produce the right power curve. And what Kite will see is actually system that is far more material efficient than the systems that we see today. And the reason for this is uh, uh, that we, we see a lot of uh, uh, items in the system now that is related to maybe weak grid, off grid applications and that uh, we have to take more responsibility for the supply security that will not be the case in a utility scale deployment situation. And of course, in the Ampex system, there is some items that also pulls up the mass a little bit. I, I would like to put scale cell systems in here because that's the biggest announcement. Now we have a power curve. And I, I, I know that it's about 35 metric ton, the system. So, uh, but I think that that system could easily be in this setting in a utility scale uh, around 20 ton. Uh, and then it would beat solar and wind by more than 50% on mass estimate. And this would be the biggest technology leap in the entire energy industry for decades. So I think that's a really big announcement. And the reason for this is of course, why we started Kite Mill and properly you started in the first place. It's because we are handling forces in a smarter way. We are dealing with tension and we are avoiding the, the compression forces. So a 20 kilowatt system pulls eight kilonewton, that's approximately 750 kilo. So a ground station is more than heavy enough to keep this on the ground. You don't need a big concrete foundation. You can have some simple steel support to maintain it on the ground. So that's the, the main reason. Um, and if you look on the scaling race, I come with a statement yesterday that I think the optimum for airborne wind energy on the uh, scaling level will happen before we reach one megawatt. Uh, then I have to explain how that works for wind also. So currently for conventional wind, I think the optimum is around four megawatt. We are building 10 and 15 and even 20 megawatt wind turbines. But the reason for that is that when you send things offshore, the turbine is only 30% of the cost. It's, it's all the other things that cost money. So it doesn't matter if the turbine is not cost efficient. If you can reduce the other costs, that's more important. Um, there is, of course, other advantages. Uh, but for wind turbines, the advantage is clearly to get higher up to reach better wind resources. That's the main advantage. And that sort of rules out uh, all over <laughs> by some of the other advantages. But for airborne wind, this will not be the case. We don't need bigger urban wind systems to reach higher up. So, uh, so I think there will be a scaling rise. If you look on this development, it also tend to slide as the, the learning curve gets further because we are better to deal with tolerances. We build more efficient system. I was going to say also that if you look on the scaling of our system in the small scale, even up to half a megawatt, it's the container or the casing that is the more, most mass incentive component. But you come up to larger scale, it will become the gearbox. That's the same as for conventional wind turbine. Um, well, for the kite, it's the wing skin now, and then it, it tends to become the structural component, wing beam. So, um, but, but I think uh, that we can compete and we can be better than wind power on all these metrics that I started with already uh, far before we are at uh, one megawatt. And it might be uh, scaling after that also because of the learning curves and so on. So now I want to talk a little bit about the utility market and how they will see it in the years that come. So we talk a lot about the weaker off grid market and that's fine. Airborne wind will be the best solution for that market, I agree. But the big market, the really, really big market, which is between 50 and 60% of the total wind market, that's the grid constrained market. That is because uh, as you see the map of USA here, 
people are mostly living around the coast, west and east, but most of the wind is in the center where there's no people. So that's where you want to build the wind energy capacity. The constraint then would be how to get all this energy to the people. And this is also the case other places. We have that in Norway. It's concessions approved in northern Norway, but there is no grid export capacity, so they don't use it. And in Australia, in, uh, it's all over the world. But what we know the most, because that's nearest to where we live, that's the pad constraint market. So this one has different rules. It's based on that you need to put more capacity in a smaller area and uh, build higher wind turbines. So, so in the pad constraint market, you tend to build larger turbine than what is the levelized cost of energy optimum. And then of course you have the offshore market that uh, has the worst of both, uh, sorry, the worst of both of these two market segments. And it should definitely not be the place to start. It's also a pretty small part of the global wind market, not only now, but until 2050. So it's not that interesting neither, I would say. But uh, again, airborne wind energy could also be a good solution for the offshore wind market, more than offshore wind for airborne wind. Hmm. So, uh, and some good news about the grid constraint market, and that's uh, that uh, noise is most likely not a problem, Florian, so uh, that's good. It's far from people. Um, the, the size and the, the space uh, usage is not that important, of course. Uh, but what's important is the power curve. So if you have higher availability and you can beat the conventional wind turbine in your supply, then you are a very vi viable solution. There's also other things. It's a huge problem to get all this concrete from the coast and from the heaven into, for instance, central uh, Australia, where they're going to build uh, the big next amount of power capacity, so, so logistics, also in USA, logistics is a huge problem where airborne wind will do better than conventional wind. So then we see how the utilities will see this in, in project perspective. So you, you have a project that goes from uh, initial, uh, that people are thinking of the project, uh, often in the government, until it's uh, constructed, built, put in operation. And the technology choice will normally come late in the project. That means that we will secure the sale pretty late in the project. Uh, that's one of the last things they will do when they come to financial close and, and so on. Uh, the first point where we really will make a difference is when uh, the auctions and the land lease contracts are negotiated, because that's where the utilities that believe in airborne wind will start to win contract. The moment they believe that this will be feasible, they would start to adapt their bids and uh, they, might, uh, they might come better out than the other contractors. And it helps, of course, if the authorities in the first place prepared the call for airborne wind, either by allowing airborne wind to be a part of the solution or even requiring. So this is the type of work that we need to do now up front. We, we need to make sure that uh, the enough people within the utilities understand what's happening, and we need to show that uh, the policymakers that this could make a big difference. This could be an advantage. You can imagine what kind of advantage it would be for Europe if we're going to build 30 gigawatt of uh, wind energy capacity, and they, they are really concerned now about industrial leak. It's a lot of these capacity materials that's going to be used that come from other big trade markets. Uh, if they can see that, okay, now the DAX is uh, divided <laughs> from the beginning, now we can position ourselves from the beginning, then there will be incentives to include airborne wind in the plan. And this combined with the commercial incentives that you see here, uh, that will occur when, enough, when more people start to believe in airborne wind, will uh, release a new market that is the demonstration and introduction market for airborne wind. And I think this will be a much kinder market than other markets we talk about because the main purpose with it is not to do energy security or something like that. It's to enable airborne wind to scale up the supply chains and to make the technology robust and big enough for 
uh, for uh, reaching these tar targets. So I believe that funding will increase uh, as we are going on now. Uh, we know that there has been some big mega trends in technology investment lately. It's been mentioned earlier here also. We have air taxis and air, uh, fusion powers th that have shown that it's possible to raise considerable higher amounts. It's interesting also that it's believed that the air taxi companies need to raise 800 million euro individually in order to reach commercial operation. I believe Airborne Wind can do it much cheaper for each commercial company, but it's good if we have uh, an amount like that that is realistic that people believe in, because that is exactly what we need to level expectations to make sure that um, one more the results, yeah, Thomas. thank you, this is the last one, <clears throat> to show that the, the results that uh, we are presenting now is quite remarkable compared to the level of funding that we have managed to raise. Um, and I think this is happening now, but it also helps if we together communicate this perspective. So this goes to my final <laughs> slide, a joint narrative. I think we should promote that Airborne Wind is the most suitable production technology to dominate the global energy mix. We don't need to say it will dominate the energy mix, but it's most suitable, it's most convenient because it involves less materials and it's easier to deploy it, will have la less storage and, and so on. So that should be our narrative. I think we should say that Airborne Wind will become a global megatrend because when people start to believe in it, the money will start to come into the sector. And I see no reason why this will not happen, especially not based on this week's news that we have seen. Uh, the last thing is that, um, yeah, I, I, I mentioned it before. I believe that the technology steps that we've been presented here this week is the biggest leap in the entire energy industry for decades. I've seen how solar have increased efficiency by 20% from 1995. So this is really something that should be communicated and promoted. And, and it should be stress test. And it would be excellent if people try to come up with bigger leaps. I think you will struggle to find it. So um, thank you. OK, thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah. One quick question. No, that's it. Okay. Mm. So